Welcome to a Healing Peace Podcast. We strive to create a place where women can come together to talk, grow, be refreshed, and renewed as we navigate life's hurdles. Inside this podcast series, we discuss shaping our identity, where we provide tools for conquering life's waves. Let's dive in. Welcome to a Healing Peace Podcast. We have been discussing shaping our identity. I hope you enjoyed the previous segment where we discussed our worth. I was excited about what the life coach shared in terms of resting in God's goodness. And by doing so, being able to embrace and hold the worth that he created within us. Well, we're not done. We're still talking about Ephesians. And our forthcoming segment deals with overcoming our bad habits or actions that lead us from God's light to Satan's darkness. Before I begin this segment, I first want to share the difficulties I have when I hear messages emphasizing how sinful we are. Yes, we are sinful, we are wretch, we have issues. And as I state this, I know that I've heard many people say, come here, you actually have struggles? Like you seem so spiritual. I do appreciate the compliment, but I'm human and I'm in this world and I have to deal with my flesh just like anyone else. And so when I hear just messages focusing on the wrong things about me, it's really hard for me to get excited about the good things. At the same notion though, even though I view God as very loving, merciful, and gracious, he still has a standard. He still wants us to live in a manner where we're not harming ourselves and other people. And as we talk about our bad habits that separate us from God, please be aware that I ultimately want all of us to be victors over Satan's scheme. I also want to paint a complete picture of God. As I stated before, he's merciful, he's gracious, he's loving. But he also wants us to tackle the areas of our lives that do not bring him glory. Before I continue talking about Paul in Ephesians 5, yes, we're in Ephesians 5, I want to help get us in the right mindset to help digest his charge for fellow believers. Okay, I have a question. Have you ever given someone a gift that they did not use, was ungrateful to receive it, or mistreated it. Yeah, think about it. I'm pretty sure we can come up with a couple of ideas and examples. In fact, my example is, for some odd reason, I like to give other people gifts. Don't ask me why, but I do get a kick out of it. If you're my friend, you've noticed that I'm overly perceptive. I see most things that people don't see. The benefit of this is that it allows me to see what another person likes or needs. And in that, I'm able to go and find items just right for any occasion. I remember one gift incident in particular. I have a friend who loves art and nature. Love is the death. And one day I was in a store and I noticed this beautiful jar that contained preserved flowers. I looked at it and I was like, ooh, like she would really love this. And my first thought was, okay, I gotta get it. So I picked it up and I looked at the price and then I kind of put it back down. I was like, oh uh, yeah, that's not going to work. I, I can't afford that. I was like, it's just some flowers in the jar. But I fell in love with the concept of it. I knew that she would really enjoy it. 
So me being an engineer, I said, okay, come here. It's time to figure this out. I picked up the jar again and I examined it very thoroughly. And it appeared to be preserved with some kind of oil. And I said, surely I can do the same thing. It's not complicated. So I went to a discount store, I bought some mineral oil, a mason jar, and then I went to pick flowers. I put all the components together and got a little nice car, put it in a nice little bag, and then I gave her my gift. Upon receiving the gift, she thanked me, <laughs> but she's an artist. So I'm pretty confident she thought, uh, yeah, that's not really a nice gift. <laughs> Anyways, I was proud of myself. I went and visited about a week later. And I saw the gift in the cupboard. I was like, man, you know, I spent all this time trying to make this work. Why in the world in the cupboard? It should at least be on the mantle where everybody can see it. I thought it was beautiful. And then, but I, I remained quiet. I didn't say anything. And then a couple of weeks later, I came back. And then I noticed that it wasn't even in the cupboard anymore. It was gone. It wasn't even in the house. Okay. I'm going to stop right there. We're going to come back to this story. But I want us to think for a moment. What I experience is very similar to how God gifts us with salvation and wanting us to appreciate his gift. He thought about our likes and our needs, and he then prepares something very lavish, very lavish for us. Now, unlike my story, God doesn't shortchange the lavish. <laughs> he doesn't take a shortcut. He doesn't go and find a replacement gift, but he spends the extra time and resources to make sure that we feel special, loved, and thought about. He then looks in anticipation to see how we will use it and how we will display his gift. He knows, I mean, he really knows that it doesn't belong in a cupboard or that it should vanish altogether. No, 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 no. That's not how it's supposed to go down. He put energy, effort, love, and attention to what has been given. He expects the gift to be adored, received, and treated properly. For believers and non-believers, how does this apply? Well, we can treat God's gift of salvation poorly by reverting to our bad habits or simply our sinful behavior that places us in darkness. We pick up in Ephesians 5, 1 through 14. Paul requests believers to be imitators of God by not living in darkness, but walking in the light. Actually, in Acts 26, Paul uses the terminology of opening our eyes so that we can turn from darkness to light and from the dominion of Satan to God. If you have been with us since the beginning of this series, you remember that the very first podcast was about having eyes that see God. We then talked about having eyes that overcome depression. If you haven't listened to these episodes, please go back. I actually recommend stopping now. Stop, with, stop listening and go and start from the beginning if you haven't done so. Each episode builds and strengthens you so that you can tackle what I'm about to share. Again, I want us to be victorious over Satan's schemes, victorious over our flesh, and the things previously shared kind of begins that equipment, begins that mm, 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 strength of, I can do this. Okay, for those who are still with me, let's get down to the nitty gritty. 
In Ephesians 5, Paul is requesting that we have the eyes that see that turns from darkness to light. Now, what behavior exhibits darkness? Well, we've heard it all before. Immorality, impurity, greed, coarse joking, evil desires, drunkenness, and the list continues. <laughs> okay, what about our bad habits? Well, bad habits are areas of our lives that does not produce good. These habits usually have us focused on pleasing our flesh versus taking the extra step to produce goodness. Okay, I'm gonna give you a couple examples. How about overeating? Eating. What about not listening to others, cutting them off, not resting and taking care of your body physically and mentally? For the not resting piece, usually, we are concerned with the needs of others or the desires of ourselves, and we neglect our own needs, which produce the goodness that we need in our lives. Some other bad habits, I'm pretty sure you've heard of these too. Maybe smoking, eating fast food, texting while driving, drinking too much coffee. This too has a list that goes on and on and on. But you know what? Paul challenged believers and reminds us that we're no longer in darkness. Instead, we are to live in the light. Okay, what does this light look like? Ooh, that's a tongue twist. Long the males. Light look like. It is actually bearing the fruits of the Spirit. In Galatians 5, the fruits of the Spirit are known as love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, faithfulness, and self-control. When we focus our attention to live in this manner, then we're trying to learn how to please God. We, we're not focused on our flesh. Now, as I share this, you may be thinking, well, shucks, uh, it's hard living like that. Everything in the world tells me to do the complete opposite. Everywhere I turn, sex, drugs, and dare I say rock and roll. This seems nearly impossible. I cannot give up my bad habits. I can't give up booze or pornography. I can't give up sex. What do you mean I have to be self-controlled and not indulge? Well, you guys, I actually totally understand this way of thinking. As I stated before, I got issues too. And in those issues, I wrestle with my own demons and addictions where I keep going to the wrong things for comfort. In fact, I was unable to leave that lifestyle until I had a mind change that my life was worth more than the temporary fix. I had to understand that God had a purpose for my life. How I was living kept me trapped in shame and guilt. Shame and guilt, shame and guilt, shame and guilt, shame and guilt. And in this shame and guilt, I tried to do more things to make me feel better about myself. But it was always temporary. It left me exhausted and hiding out. But you know what? Paul understood this. He knew that there was a lot of temptation in the world. He knew that it was easy to worship the created versus the creator. 
But as I said before in one other previous podcast, Paul is actually a smart brother. And he provides insight to how to overcome it. Are you ready to hear the ways to overcome it? The first one, he states, trying to learn how to please God. Now, the parallel scripture in Romans 12 states, do not conform to the world, but be transformed by renewing your mind so that you may prove what the will of God is. I'm going to say it again. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what the will of God is. Pleasing God means learning what his will is. It's renewing your mind to his will. So how do we do it? How do we overcome our bad habits? How do we overcome our sin? By changing our mindset about it. It wasn't until I stopped thinking that the addiction was the only thing I had of value. Instead, I needed to renew my mind and realize that God was the only true value that I had and needed. Yes, that God was the only true value that I had and needed. I had to know that he will meet all of my needs and not this temporary fix. This is the same for you. Whatever lie your bad habit or sinful nature or flesh is telling you, at some point, you must realize for yourself that God has a better life for you, that he will meet all of your needs, now, Paul, he wasn't finished. He knew that besides a new mind, we required something else to keep us walking in the light. He tells us not to participate in unfruitful deeds. Now, this one may seem a little obvious. You're like, yeah, don't live crazy. I got you. But in actuality, Paul was also talking about being around others or not being around others who are living in darkness. He first indicates believers that need to be avoided. <laughs> yes, I know you know, some believers act the fool. Yeah, they do. They're people who profess God in their lives, but going to strip clubs, sleeping around, drinking excessively, cussing people out, fits of rage, all that. And so those relationships, yeah, it's time to say goodbye to them. Cut them off. And then not only is he talking about believers that you need to stay away from, but non-believers. If they are keeping you from living in the light, then say goodbye to those relationships. It's hard enough to do the right thing than to also have pressure from your friends telling you to do the wrong thing. Man, that's too much work. This also applies to overcoming your bad habits. Surround yourself around people who are enforcing your good habits and supporting you to maintain your healthy choices. If you have a hard time overeating, then don't hang around people who like to eat all day and eat unhealthy food. There you go. But Paul continues. He says, not only should you not participate in darkness, but also expose the darkness. John 3 states that those who do evil hate the light and do not come to the light due to fear that their deeds will be exposed. On the contrary, those who do what is true comes to the light. So their works can be seen and carried in God. This passage is key. Most people, uh, I was one of them, 
are so consumed by shame and guilt of our deeds that we do not go to God. And we think, hey, he doesn't want to be with me. Mm -mm, I'm a hot mess. Yeah, that may be true. You may be a hot mess. But this passage says, yes, expose it and let God help you carry the burden of it. He wants to renew and, fresh up and refresh us so that we are focused on doing his will versus the will of Satan. He doesn't want us to stay trapped in that behavior. And here's another reason why we're called to expose it, so that we can identify that it's wrongful behavior and so that we're not teaching others to do the same thing. I was watching this movie once. Uh, I will say that for it wasn't the best choice, but the main character would eat dinner and watch pornography every night. That was what he did. That was his routine. And then one day he finally got out the house and he was out with a group of friends. Somehow it accidentally came out because he was laughing about it and thought it was cool. And he told them what he was doing. And everybody looked at him in shock and <laughs> felt terrible about his behavior. They were like, what in the world? And you know what? If he never said anything, his behavior would have seemed normal and acceptable. Okay, you know how I like to do my little recap, so let's recap. What is Paul's list for overcoming bad habits and sins? First, we need a mind change. And how do we have this mind change? By focusing on God and his will. Second, change our company. Change the people we're hanging around with. Third, expose them as bad habits and sinful behavior. So let's go back. Remember I said I'm going to go back to my story? Okay, let's go back to my story about me giving my gift to my friend. I was looking hard for the gift, and she knew I was looking, and she politely told me, uh, come here, well, you know, the flower is kind of rotted, so I had to throw the gift away. <laughs> I was devastated. <laughs> you mean all of my hard work was tossed out in the garbage? Now, as I share this, you may be thinking, why did you not just YouTube it or Google it to make sure you were doing it right? Good questions. And I will kind of say that I'm showing my age on this one, but that was before they were real popular. So, and then I was like, oh, I'm an engineer. I'll figure it out. <laughs> well, unfortunately, that way of thinking did not work out too well. My gift was thrown out because it was rotten. And this is similar when we live in darkness. Our deeds are dead rotten. We may think, hey, we give God some good. At least I showed up. You know, I've heard that statement many times. I've also heard the statement, well, God knows my heart. And we make that statement, but we're still living in a manner that's completely against him. So I'll tell y'all this now. It's hard to say, but I'm going to tell you. Don't be fooled. God does not want our rotten gifts. Yes, he's gracious and merciful to the point that he allows us to keep trying to present him with a gift that does not rot. Like Paul, okay, like Paul, I'm going to end on a positive note. And he ends with a promise. He says, when we shed our dead deeds of living in darkness, then God would no longer be angry. Why is he angry? Because A, we're giving him a rotten gift and we're disregarding the gift that he gave us. He says, not only will God no longer be angry, but Christ will also shine upon you. It's in God's mercy that Christ shines upon us. When we expose our behavior, our sins, and our bad habits, God is no longer angry. And Christ is right beside us, shining his light so that we can continue to be in the light. What a great promise. What a great promise. What a great promise. And because of this great promise, let us not be afraid to overcome our bad habits. Let's just tackle them. All right. I talked enough. I, I hope this is encouraging and helpful to inspire us to move beyond the things that have us trapped 
in a lifestyle that God doesn't want us to be in. And I'm not fooled. You know, just because you hear a good lesson doesn't mean that you can catch it right away. So our next episode, we're going to learn practical tools for overcoming bad habits. And the first thing we're going to talk about is the fear that keeps us from moving out of the shadows to healthy behavior. Join us next week. You will be grateful that you did.